Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar presented by the UF IFAS Center for Public Issues Education and Agriculture and Natural Resources. Um, I say it's for, and we also go by the Pi Center for short. Um, it's presented by the Pi Center, but also in um, cooperation with FDAX and NOAA, and we'll get into a little bit more about that project and the partnership there. Uh, before we get started, um, I do want to do just a very quick introduction. I'll introduce our speakers and a little bit about today's webinar, and then I'll turn it over to them, and we'll get started with the presentations. So first off, um, you can go to PiCenter.com to learn about um, our upcoming webinars. You can also access our previously recorded webinars there. Today's webinar right now is being recorded. So um, for all of those that registered, which should be pretty much everyone, uh, you should receive an email once the uh, recording is posted. Also for today's presentation, um, if you have questions or comments, use the Q&A feature in Zoom. You can use that throughout the entire webinar. Feel free to put in questions at any time. We will have a designated Q&A in about the last 15 minutes or so of today's session. Also, as you're exiting today, please use or please fill out the post-webinar evaluation. It should automatically load in your internet browser as you're exiting today's webinar. And it takes about three minutes or so to do. So we really appreciate your feedback there. So at this point, we'll go ahead and introduce our speakers. Um, you're gonna hear from Dr. Ricky Teld second and uh, Dr. Ken Riley first. So I'm gonna introduce uh, Ricky Teld first and then go to Ken Riley, and um, they will tell you a little bit more about what they're gonna speak on. Uh, Dr. Ricky Telg is a professor in the Department of Agricultural Education and Communication at the University of Florida and the director of the Center for Public Issues Education and Agriculture and Natural Resources, or Pi Center, as I previously said. His research interests include agricultural communication, uh, including television, video production, print media, and media relations. Uh, also distance education, including instructional design and instructional media. And so Dr. Ricky Tell will be talking about the educational toolkit for this aquaculture project. Uh, Dr. Ken Riley will be talking more about aquaculture possibilities in Florida and kind of the current status of things. So Dr. Ken Riley is a distinguished aquaculture scientist and interdisciplinary marine ecologist. He recently joined NOAA Fisheries Office of Aquaculture. Ken is a science advisor and responsible for oversight of the aquaculture science portfolio, which aims to use world-class expertise to spur innovation and advance science for sustainable aquaculture development. Ken's research focused on developing analytical tools and modeling applications used for siting aquaculture operations. So once again, I wanna thank everyone for being on today's webinar. And I want to thank our speakers. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ken Riley, and I'm going to go ahead and pull up his slides at this time. So just give me one moment. That sounds great. And while Philip's pulling up those slides, can um, the guys at the Pi Center, do you guys mind sharing whether you can hear me all right? Yes, I, I can hear you. That's, that sounds fantastic. Well, everybody, it's a it's a pleasure to meet you. We're having a little um, technical difficulties with Zoom this morning with our government computers over here at NOAA. So I appreciate um, Philip moderating and, and helping with my um, slide presentation. So in just a moment, he's going to pull up my slides. Um, I do work with the NOAA um, National Marine Fishery Service Office of Aquaculture. And um, as is the case when you work with any large government agency, um, today's slides and the information and the science um, that we're presenting is the work of many. And so I work with an amazing team. I lead a science branch of coordinators that work across all of NOAA and the regions um, to help advance um, aquaculture science for industry management and, uh, and, and our coastal communities. So today I'm going to be sharing with you uh, science for pioneering uh, marine aquaculture. And uh, I'll just um, nudge and just say next slide on in between slides. So, um, so it's a pleasure to share with you our work on aquaculture. And when we talk about aquaculture, I want to be clear that we're talking about the culture of fish, shellfish, seaweeds, um, a, the culture of aquatic organisms. Now at NOAA, our focus is of course on marine, um, marine organisms and, uh, and that central focus, but want to acknowledge that there's a lot of aquaculture occurring across the country. 
with catfish and crawfish and a number of other species that include the encompass the freshwater components as well. This year for Earth Day, it was really exciting to have a visit from Al Roker and uh, the teams at NBC to celebrate that aquaculture is part of the blue economy. It is part of how we're building a climate resilient strategy to seafood production. And so we'd encourage you to, um, you can easily Google and check out some of the news stories that came out on Earth Day and um, Al Roker's visit to the NOAA labs and to industry partners in the Southwest and the Northeast United States. Next slide, please. So a lot of times we're asked to talk about the broader mission of seafood at NOAA, and we do wanna celebrate that our seafood solutions include and incorporate wild seafood, wild capture caught seafood, as well as farm-raised um, seafood. In the United States, Americans eat upwards to 19 pounds of seafood each year. Those top species that are consumed include um, shrimp and salmon and tuna. Next slide. I'd like to talk a little bit through the numbers as most of us are aware that, you know, seafood is an important part. It's a nutritious part of a healthy diet. Um, it's recommended that we consume two servings of seafood um, each week. And right now Americans are consuming about half of that or about five ounces of seafood each week. But if we were to consume um, that recommended allowance of two sea seafood servings each week, we could see a 17% reduction in death rate, a 37% reduction in cardiovascular disease. So we are working on, on making sure that um, Americans have a source of uh, reliable, safe, nutritious seafood. Next slide. And then if we look at where our seafood is sourced from and where it comes from, um, right at present right now, about 80 to 90% of our seafood is imported. It represents a very large trade deficit of about $18 billion. Our commercial harvest of seafood in this country are valued at about $5.6 billion. Um, if if uh, we would only be able to supply based on current commercial harvest as well as aquaculture, about 40% of the seafood demand if, um, if, our, if our imports uh, stopped. And then finally, our, um, our wild fisheries are at about 100% of our capacity. Going back about 30 years in the late 80s and early 90s, we kind of realized that for fisheries management to truly be sustainable, we are kind of working through management of our commercial fisheries and recognizing that, that they kind of have plateaued in their production. And while we may open new fisheries or explore new areas for commercial development, the total mass or biomass that's being extracted from our oceans, not just in the United States, but globally has kind of reached this plateau. And to meet the increasing global demand and population growth, um, this is being met by aquaculture, by freshwater aquaculture in many cases, but increasingly um, we're looking to the ocean to be able to develop aquaculture. Next slide. And at NOAA, we have aquaculture that, um, we have a, a NOAA aquaculture program that occurs across all of our line offices. And so as with any large government agency, you have offices and divisions and programs. And in our, in our NOAA aquaculture program, most of the work is occurring across NOAA fisheries with our Office of Aquaculture, our regional offices and our science centers, the National Ocean Service, and the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science within the National Ocean Service, and, and um, our partners with the Oceanic and Atmospheric Research Office and the National Sea Grant College Program. And so that's, a, that's what consists of our NOAA aquaculture program. And of course, as farmers across America, as fishermen across America, we look to our, our line office with the National Weather Service too for the web, daily weather forecast, the ocean forecast, the wave climates, and those kind of things that keep um, the wheels on our economy. Next slide. And so at NOAA, our vision is that, um, that aquaculture is supportive of, of competitive aquaculture businesses. Um, helps grow coastal economies. We believe aquaculture can be part of our healthy aquatic environments and help contribute to resilience in our healthy aquatic environments. And that we're working to build an aquaculture industry that is truly, truly valued by the, by the public. And our, our philosophy is, is that sustainable aquaculture represents um, the, represents um, an economic viability, environmental stewardship and social responsibility. Next slide. All right, so last October, we were 
pleased to present the NOAA um, strategic plan for aquaculture development. While NOAA and the Department of Commerce over the last 10 or 15 years have had strong policies for aquaculture development, this was actually our first aquaculture strategic plan. And so we did a number of listening sessions and presented this out to the aquaculture community and to our broader base of stakeholders. And we're excited that the, this, this aquaculture strategic plan shapes our vision for the next five years and, and specifically addresses the goals to manage aquaculture sustainably and efficient, efficiently, lead science for sustainability, and that's a large part of our portfolio, educate and exchange information, make sure that we're not just educating and informing the industry and the opportunities for industry growth and development, but also educate about the opportunities for restoration and resilient aquaculture, as well as educate and inform our broader stakeholder base in our coastal communities. And then finally, support economic viability and growth in the communities where aquaculture um, is continuing to, to grow and flourish. And then very recently, we released the draft of the NOAA National Seafood Strategy, which the second goal of that strategy is to increase sustainable U.S. aquaculture production. Next slide. From the perspective of, of our vision for aquaculture, we really wanna grow and expand aquaculture to diversify coastal economies, support working water fronts to grow the blue economy. We know that aquaculture creates economic opportunities that supports businesses of all sizes. Um, we believe that place-based local food production helps keep jobs and money in local communities. It often costs less and builds community support for those local food systems. Producing more seafood can help alleviate food insecurity and aquaculture um, can, else, can also help um, preserve cultural heritage. In many communities around America, we've been growing oysters and other shellfish species for hundreds of years and it's an important part of that cultural heritage. Also I wanna recognize that one aspect of aquaculture is that it encompasses many, many small farms. And this is just the case for aquaculture in Florida, such as the the small shellfish farms, the clam and oyster farms that are along the coast. And in many cases, these farmers are readily looking to adopt environmentally friendly procedures for, for farming, new gear, new cultural practices. Um, and the other piece there is that because these small farms form this large network, they're able to often adapt to changing environmental conditions and they often rebuild um, in, the, in the face of the disasters that may occur such as um, the hurricanes or tropical storms that, that form along Florida's coast. Next slide. This is our vision of what um, aquaculture might look like in some coastal communities around the country. And the concept here is, is that aquaculture can help grow resilient coastal communities. We believe that it is a community decision um, in terms of um, how, what that aquaculture looks like for every community around the country. And in some, you know, some locations, it may be oyster farms or, or clam farms in the estuaries or mussel farms or seaweed farms, kelp farms in the coastal ocean, or perhaps offshore aquaculture operations with fish farms or multi-trophic aquaculture operations in the, in the open ocean or um, offshore environment. And that complements all the other parts of the coastal economy uh, that are occurring along our, our coastal communities. Next slide. So over the next few slides, I'd like to just give you a snapshot of what aquaculture looks like today. And I'd like to end by saying what aquaculture might look like tomorrow. And so here we have a oyster, oyster farm from Caminata Bay, um, oyster farm in, in Louisiana. I wanna share that you know 60% of our nation's oysters come out of Louisiana. And the farms in Louisiana are going under this transformation of historical culture practices and gardening practices of growing oysters on the wild bottom to the fact that they're looking at new technologies to improve production and uh, increase value for oyster production, such as this is happening in Louisiana, but it's happening in every coastal community where oyster growth, oyster aquaculture growth has experienced you know, tremendous surges. Next slide. Here we have Southern Cross Sea Farms out of Cedar Key, Florida. And uh, so we wanna make sure that we, we, you'll hear a lot of excitement and talk about the growth of oyster farms, but clam farming has been a threshold of, of shellfish farming in, in Florida for many years, dating back to the 90s. And myself having worked as a scientist at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institution, um, taught 
hundreds and hundreds of farmers to become clam farmers in, in Florida. And glad to see that as a resilient industry. Next slide. In some places, kelp farming and seaweed farming is gaining a lot of attention. Now, generally, this is, this is in cool or cold water environments, such as the Northeast United States, the waters off of California, and certainly the next frontier for kelp farming and seaweed farming is in, in Alaska. But there's actually some seaweed farming that's happening in Florida and some experimental farms that are occurring right off of Tampa and the St. Pete area. Next slide. Here we see an example of land-based marine aquaculture. And uh, in this case, we have um, sturgeon that are being cultured and recirculating aquaculture systems. Recirculating aquaculture systems are systems that efficiently recycle, reuse um, the water to ensure water quality conditions are suitable for the fish, to maintain environmental efficiencies and to increase um, energy efficiency. And so in this case, they're producing the high value uh, caviar that you see there. Next slide. This is an example of what net pen aquaculture in um, large deep embayments or fjords um, in the northwest or northwest might look like. This is a salmon farm in Maine. It's Cobbs Cook Bay, Maine. There's a number of salmon farms that are distributed across Maine. And uh, this is Cook aquaculture. Next slide. Now, this is a vision of what offshore aquaculture looks like. So the last slide um, truly is surface net pens that are used for raising salmon, but those net pens are designed for those kind of protected environments. When we talk about offshore aquaculture, we have to recognize that the engineering really is built around, um, you know, the fact that these farms are sited in environments that are exposed to the open ocean conditions. Strong waves, high currents, storms, um, a, a changing and variable ocean environment. And so this is blue ocean mariculture. It's off of Kona, Hawaii. And uh, they grow Almaco Jack or Kampachi in those net pens that you see there. Those net pens are submerged when they're in production. And then they are raised to the surface for harvest and for, for maintenance activities that are occurring. It's quite a unique type of production system that you see there. And it's actually sited within a national marine, the humpback, humpback whale national marine sanctuary system. So. It's, uh, it's cited in a, in a place that is very dear and, and, and culturally important. Next slide. And then we also, because we're talking in Florida, we wanna think about all the other types of aquaculture that is occurring in Florida, especially with the, the marine focus. And so the live, the live rock farms that occur off of Southwest and Florida and the, and the, and the Florida Keys, um, this is a, a vibrant industry that helps support the ornamental fish industry um, that is both freshwater and marine there in South Florida. And here you can see KP Aquatics growing corals and live rock um, in that coastal ocean environment. We have farms that are in state waters as well as offshore and federal waters or the exclusive economic zone. Next slide. What I'd like to do now is share with you a little bit about some of the science, technology and innovation. So through the last 30 or 40 years of, of work to develop aquaculture in the nation and around the globe, we've learned that the production of fish is one of the most efficient forms of protein when we have to think about um, agricultural crops or livestock that have to be fed. And so here you can see an example of, of farm-raised fish um, using a, a little over a pound of, of feed to produce a pound of fish. That's really, really important when you compare that to those other livestock. It's also really important when you consider that feed cost in aquacultural operations cost about 50% of your business or operating cost. And so having a highly efficient organism such as fish that can convert that feed into food, into protein, it's really, really important. My next slide is gonna share a little bit more about how we're working to do that. So here you can see an example of, of how we've been working increasingly to um, make feeds more efficient in that feed conversion and also focus on a reduction of fish meal and fish oil, the requirements of fish meal and fish oil in these feeds. And so what you'll see is since the 90s um, and up to present day, so over the last 30 years, we've seen a significant reduction of, of fish meal and fish oil in um, feed products. A lot of this comes through making 
more nutritious, highly valued um, feeds, but it also comes through. And if we look at the right side of the slide there, you'll see um, increased monitoring and observation and science and research to study how fish are utilizing that feed, how they're feeding, their behavior, their physiology, and that, that feed conversion. And now in offshore net pens systems, you know, we wanna make sure that when we feed fish, they're not, there's not a lot of feed loss. And so we actually have camera systems and automated systems that help ensure that literally all the feed is consumed by the fish and we're not having feed wastage. Next slide. This is some additional science and technology. Um, we've had a major focus in um, NOAA and in the National Ocean Service focused on siting, um, siting for marine aquaculture, siting and using spatial analysis to look at what are the particular locations, the ocean real estate, the coastal real estate in which we would site oyster farms, seaweed farms, or finfish farms. This past year, um, we published an aquaculture atlas for the Gulf of Mexico. We similarly published one for Southern California, and we're working our way around the nation to publish these aquaculture atlases so they can inform that we are using the best available science in citing aquaculture. On the right side of your screen, and I hope the video is coming through, but it's some, how, some of the ways that we're also studying how in some locations where we site farms, like oyster farms, those oyster farms also provide valuable habitat. They not only improve the water quality through filtration and, and, the, and those kind of ecosystem services, but they also provide habitat for different recreationally and commercially uh, important species. Next slide. And then here, I'll kind of round out the, talk, the pieces of the talk on science and technology. We're talking about um, how we're using you know, our NOAA satellites, our NASA satellites, help improve how we're monitoring and forecasting things like harmful algal blooms and water quality and the changing coastal ocean and climatic conditions that our oceans are facing. Um, we're regularly producing operational forecasts for harmful algal blooms in the Gulf of Mexico. We know that's critically important for those communities along the Florida's Gulf Coast. On the right side of your screen, you'll see some ways that aquaculture is using integrated pest management approaches. We're co-culturing, we're culturing with Atlantic salmon, we're culturing species such as wrasse and lumpfish, which can eat parasitic parasites that will often be found on some of these farm fish or would be found on wild fish as well. But by co-culturing natural predator prey relationships, um, we're able to healthily keep fish in culture conditions of high health and, and increase the welfare of those fish. Next slide. And then finally, I wanna talk about what aquaculture might look like tomorrow. And so there's some exciting things on the forefront. Um, among this is like integrated multi-trophic aquaculture. That concept of, of IMTA means that we're culturing seaweeds and shellfish and finfish all together, such that those, those, the production of those systems add value to each other. The nutrients that are um, being emitted from the thin fish operation can feed into the, to the seaweed production and to, can feed into the shellfish production. We're also increasingly um, seeing more land-based recirculating aquaculture systems, such as the salmon farms that we might see in Wisconsin and such as we might see in South Florida with like Atlantic Sapphire. And then finally, in the Western Gulf and some other places around the country, we're seeing aquaculture being considered as co-siting with offshore energy. This can be oil and gas, or this could be with wind or marine hydrokinetic, but using the other industries that are, that are occurring in the offshore environment and siting aquaculture with those industries. Next slide. And then here, I just wanna share that NOAA is continually making a significant investment in research. This research occurs in our science centers. It occurs with partners in academia and with nonprofit organizations. It occurs in partnership with industry. And so these are some samples of our science products and science advice um, that have been used to advance marine aquaculture. And so we have significant work on feeds and genetics and hatchery technology, engineering, um, aquatic animal health. And then we also extend to developing tools for workforce development, and, uh, and then um, stakeholder um, outreach, educate, marine education, K through 12 educational products and things like that. So 
to, to broadly advance marine aquaculture in the United States. Next slide. What I'd like to share with you now is some, some of the Gulf of Mexico aquaculture happening, some things that are happening in your neighborhoods perhaps. And so um, we'll lead off the list, just sharing some of the, the, the broad things that are happening, some of the exciting things that are happening. Um, so in the Western Gulf, Gulf Offshore Research Institute is evaluating offshore platforms for aquaculture development. They're also evaluating the, the reuse and recycling of those platforms for renewable energy and other types of blue economy um, activities. Dolphin Island Sea Lab in partnership with um, the University of Southern Mississippi, Auburn and others um, are leading on an IMTA project. So that's that integrated multi-trophic aquaculture project to grow seaweeds and oysters and fish uh, in the waters off of, uh, off of Alabama, they're off of Dolphin Island. Mana Fish Farms in the University of Southern Miss Mississippi are pursuing a commercial project to develop a fish farm for red drum about 16 nautical miles south of Pensacola, Florida. Um, this would be a commercial endeavor in, those, in federal waters of the United States with significant hatchery infrastructure being built out there uh, at the port of Pensacola. Ocean Era is pursuing permits and will soon launch the Valella Epsilon project off of uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. It's about 40 miles uh, west of St. Petersburg. Gulf Stream aquaculture is just right now in the very infancy of exploring some areas in South Florida, um, particularly off the Florida Keys outside of the National Marine Sanctuaries area, but, but perhaps some areas that are not currently being used by commercial fishing or navigation or commerce. They're looking for areas for aquaculture development there down off the Florida Keys that could complement the commercial and recreational fishing that occurs in, the, in that region. And then the last part here is one that I'll share a little bit more on is the state of Florida working with NOAA and our, our colleagues at the National Ocean Service, National Center for Coastal Ocean Science. I'm um, initiated spatial planning research to explore development of offshore aquaculture zones. And I'll share more about that in just a moment. Next slide. So we have a lot of offshore aquaculture happening in the Gulf of Mexico. This is complementary to a lot of the other aquaculture projects that are happening around the nation in our, in our ocean space. Um, but just wanna acknowledge that a significant part of our aquaculture portfolio is that our shellfish farms, our seaweed farms that are occurring in our state waters um, constitute a large portion of our aquaculture development in the country, specifically marine aquaculture development. These are some of the major customers for the science that um, we're working on every day. For, and it's working with partners in EPA and Army Corps, Department of Defense, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The, so a lot of the science products that are coming out of NOAA are being used to help inform those management decisions with, our, with those federal agencies. Next slide, please. In terms of site selection in my work in my portfolio over the past 10 years, um, we've completed over 50 analysis for spatial planning and siting of aquaculture. We've been working towards development of options for aquaculture opportunity areas in the Gulf of Mexico and Southern California. And just a couple of weeks ago, it was announced that the next region for spatial planning for aquaculture opportunity areas will be in Alaska. Um, we worked with a number of states to help them use spatial planning tools, spatial planning science for state designated aquaculture use areas. And then in some locations, we've worked with specific ports and harbors like San Diego, Port of New Bedford, um, to help these ports and harbors with their own jurisdictions think about how aquaculture might complement the commercial fishing in those, in those areas. We produce public facing tools, we produce tools that Folks can independently navigate and use to help explore the ocean space and find the right location for their aquaculture project and other kinds of ocean industries. Next slide. So the last part of my talk here will just be about marine spatial planning and just wanna acknowledge that like our oceans are busy, busy, space, busy spaces. We have shipping and navigation and transportation, a lot of activities that are occurring. We have national security and military activities that are occurring. The waters off of the Gulf Coast of Florida are tremendously used by the Air Force and by the Navy and in their training activities. We have a lot of recreation and tourism. We have existing commercial fishing, recreational fishing and aquaculture activities occurring, cultural resources 
And our communities, you know, they all truly value our oceans in many, many different ways. And then we have in energy infrastructure and other types of offshore aquaculture, other types of offshore infrastructure occurring. And then finally, we have a lot of natural resources. And NOAA has conservation and preservation mandates to protect pr protected resources, to protect fisheries, to protect habitat. And so marine spatial planning encompasses all these to ensure that we're planning for um, a fair use, multiple uses of our coastal ocean space. Next slide. And so in thinking about marine spatial planning, we use a scientific approach of marine spatial suitability modeling. We develop these kind of complex models where we can explore the whole ecosystem to capture all the ocean use, all the natural cultural resources that are occurring there. And we can develop essentially heat maps um, to help us better understand where would be areas to develop new industries such as aquaculture um, or where would areas um, be met with constraints or conflicts. And so I just like to point everybody down to the, to the map there on the bottom right. And this is just an example of, of what a spatial modeling output might look like. And the, and the idea here is that we develop a heat map and areas that would be less suitable for aquaculture development or perhaps have constraints would be scored at a low level and through the modeling, modeling process would result in low scores and areas that would have more suitability for aquaculture will be scored at in the in those blue colorations and at, at receive higher scores. So areas where you have things like oil and gas pipelines or offshore infrastructure or coral reefs or shipwrecks and cultural resources, you know, those really wouldn't be suitable for aquaculture development. And then there's other areas um, that are less used that might be more suitable. And so we can use this modeling approach and produce these heat maps to fully understand how our oceans are used and, and identify opportunities for aquaculture development. Last slide. And so I'm real excited in the fact that in 2019, working carefully with the, and at the request of the, the state of Florida and the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Division of Aquaculture, we initiated a study, a partnership to look at some preliminary spatial planning for Florida in the state waters uh, off the Gulf Coast to assess the potential for offshore aquaculture zones um, in those areas. So where could we potentially develop offshore aquaculture for any kind of aquaculture purpose? So we didn't really identify and say that we were gonna do it just for fin fish or just for oysters or shellfish or for seaweeds or for live rock or corals, but we wanted to explore where might be some opportunities that could be further explored could lead to discovery of opportunities for aquaculture development. And so we just today have, have made, have published a, a new report on aquaculture spatial planning in Florida, a pilot study to assess potential offshore aquaculture zones along Florida's Gulf Coast. And um, we're real excited about this. We identified an estimated of 54,000 acres, 55,000 acres that could be further explored, could be further socialized and studies could be conducted. To, to assess the opportunities in, um, in these waters of the Gulf of Mexico uh, that are part of the state of Florida. So we're excited. As a follow-up to this call, I will, um, I'll share the link to this website and, and you guys can get more information. I also wanna say that in the Southeast, we have um, regional aquaculture coordinators, Andrew Richard and Kylie Herf, and their contact information is there on the, on the screen there such that you can contact them if you have it uh, specific questions about your aquaculture project. And then finally, if you don't mind, I'll just close with one last slide there that is the uh, just acknowledging that we truly, truly believe that partnerships drive innovation. We appreciate the opportunity to work with the state of Florida, um, the Pi Center, um, Gulf States Marine Fish Commission, Sea Grant, and, and all of you all in uh, helping to, to grow aquaculture around the country. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, there'll be time for questions uh, through the Q&A in just a minute or two. But I wanted to, to uh, go ahead and share my screen. Let's see if I can do this correctly. All right. There we go. All right. So I think everyone can see my, should say, about the project at the top there. Uh, again, I'm Ricky Tell. Uh, I am the director for the UF IFA Center for Public Issues, Education and Agriculture and Natural Resources, 
or better known sometimes as the Pi Center. I'm going to give a, uh, a quick update and overview of the project and project partners. The just completed research an education project focused on developing stakeholder collaboration and a communication process for sustainable aquaculture development in Florida's state waters of the Gulf of Mexico. And the partners were the Pi Center, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services Division of Aquaculture, and NOAA National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. Now, most of you probably know about the Division of Aquaculture and NOAA and the Centers and the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, but you may not know about the Pi Center. So I just want to give a, a real brief overview of what we do here. The Pi Center examines how people think about, form, and also act on opinions regarding complex agricultural and natural resource issues. Well, we were approached to conduct the research uh, focus groups and then develop a communication toolkit based on these and other research findings. Now, the overall project focused on laying the foundation for a large scale stakeholder collaboration process that could inform social context and an ecosystem services management framework for aquaculture in Florida. While this project focused on state waters in Florida, it's expected that the collaborative process and the lessons learned will be applicable more broadly to other coastal states as aquaculture continues to develop in the coming years. I'll provide more context about some of the focus group research results in just a couple of moments. But first, I wanted to provide an overview of the communication toolkit and then provide more details on it a little later. The purpose of these communication toolkit materials uh, is to educate various audiences about aquaculture operations in Florida, the potential benefits of responsible offshore aquaculture practices, and how various concerns are being addressed. Specifically, the toolkit uh, includes social media, uh, issue guides, which again, I'll mention in just a second, uh, PowerPoint slides, informational video, and then instructions on how to use all the materials. Now, focus groups were held, two in person and two virtual, to identify themes regarding stakeholders' perceptions and understanding of aquaculture. And the following themes emerge from the focus groups. Uh, interest in supporting local economies. So focus group participants mentioned that aquaculture could benefit the economies of local coastal communities. Overall, though, participants were unfamiliar with the topic of aquaculture, and most didn't have a, a knowledge about the potential benefits of aquaculture production. After learning what the term aquaculture meant in the focus group, participants wondered if aquaculture would support a sustainable marine ecosystem. <clears throat> Similarly, some focus group participants thought that funding should be prioritized to restoring and conserving Florida's coastal waters and ecosystem before introducing aquaculture. In terms of informing and involving youth, participants said that they thought aquaculture would be interesting to youth through educational programs and in field trips. Some participants wondered if there were any negative, potential negative human health impacts of consuming what they considered it as farmed fish or aquaculture versus wild caught fish. And then some focus group participants raised concerns about potential risks or consequences of aquaculture, including unintended fish escapes due to bad weather or possible food uh, fish waste production in a concentrated area. And so what we did is based on these major themes, <clears throat> the Pi Center focused on four major topic or message areas about aquaculture. Aquaculture in Florida, onshore versus offshore aquaculture operations, the benefits of offshore aquaculture, and how concerns that they had brought up are being addressed. These major message areas were the genesis of the communication toolkit, which is geared to be used by extension faculty, stakeholders, and others interested in aquaculture to inform and educate target audiences about aquaculture, since one of the major themes was an overall general lack of knowledge about aquaculture. Here are the two QR codes and links that we'd recommend that you visit. The one on the left, the Pi Center Toolkit, has all the materials we're going to go through now. The link on the right is FDAX's Aquaculture Educa Educator uh, resource page. And we'll also include the QR codes and links at the end of this webinar presentation as well. All right. First, the toolkit. <clears throat> when you go to the Pi Center link, you'll come to this web page. 
It provides an overview of the project and then links to all of the toolkit contents. The FDAX link will take you to this page, which provides resources for aquaculture educators. The Pi Center page also links to the FDAX aquaculture educator resource page. But back on the Pi Center's aquaculture communication toolkit page, you'll want to download the aquaculture toolkit guide. This is like an instructor's guide on what the overall toolkit has and how to integrate each piece of the toolkit into presentations or social media campaigns. Because everyone gets a large part of their information through social media nowadays, the development of a social media graphic and, and captions uh, was a major part of this toolkit. The graphic on the left is just one example of many of the content on aquaculture that you could use in social media posts. On the right, you'll see a screenshot of a calendar of social media graphics and captions that can be used over five weeks covering these following topics or questions. What is aquaculture? Offshore aquaculture in Florida. Why is offshore aquaculture beneficial? And how are concerns being addressed? Next is an issue guide. Now, an issue guide is what the Pi Center calls an illustrated fact sheet on an, a particular topic. This front back downloadable issue guide covers the major message areas I previously mentioned and mirrors much of the content from the social media plan. In addition, a 16 slide PowerPoint slide set can be downloaded from the toolkit site. And in these PowerPoint slides, the message areas are addressed. And there are also notes in the notes view on the PowerPoint for the presenter as well. Finally, a short video of about a minute 43 can be linked in YouTube using the QR code there or downloaded straight from the toolkit site. It's a video with music and moving text graphics that explains why offshore aquaculture is beneficial. And that's the toolkit. We put the QR codes and links back up um, for you to look at at your convenience. If you want the direct link for the Pi Center's toolkit, you can go to pycenter.com slash aquaculture dash toolkit. Again, pycenter.com slash aquaculture dash toolkit, and it will take you straight to, uh, to that particular toolkit. And then for the aquaculture educator resources page, uh, for the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. It's fdax.gov slash education slash aquaculture dash educator dash resources. And both of these hopefully will be good resources from you uh, in the days and weeks to come. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'd like to hear from you. Please, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to put those questions or comments in the Q&A and we'll work on facilitating any questions that you might have. Okay. Well, I'll just pop on real quick and just say thank you, uh, Dr. Ricky Telg, and uh, thank you, Ken, for uh, sharing um, both of your presentations. And so, uh, as Ricky just mentioned, use that Q&A feature. You can type in your questions, or if you just have comments, if you just want to kind of add to the conversation, maybe share something that you're working on in your own space, uh, feel free to do that in the Q&A, and we'll address each of those questions as they come in. Okay. So we have one question. I'll, I'll go ahead and read it live and then uh, we can answer it. Is there a community checkoff program in place or some public awareness campaign for promotion of aquaculture? Uh, I'm not aware of any. Uh, I don't know if, Kate, if you know of anything along those lines, but uh, I'm not aware of that. Okay, You're, you'll have to, I think, Ken, you'll have to answer through your phone. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, I'm less familiar with the um, with the community checkoff program, but there are a lot of marketing and, and promotional materials um, for aquaculture uh, that, that are available, and we can help follow through and provide that kind of information, and, and a lot of that is with our partners. Right. 
So that would be a good place to, uh, David, to begin with, uh, again, going to the FDAX educator page. They have uh, lots of resources listed there. And again, the toolkit that you see here could be used uh, to promote aquaculture to various audiences. It is free uh, for you to use in any those type of capacities there. So we're starting to see some pop in. I'll go ahead and read these. Uh, Don mentioned a uh, great presentation. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I have an interest in the bioaccumulation of legacy chemicals. How are PFAS and other emerging contaminants being addressed? Any... And I think that would be a question for yeah. you. Yeah, a absolutely. So um, in coastal areas, um, in our spatial models, we do include consideration of, of any kind of um, dump sites, contamination sites. Um, we include all of that. We work very closely with FDA, EPA, and others um, to collect what we would call the best available data. Um, but we do know that there's a lot of ongoing research um, happening now, you know, trying to identify where those sites are at, what is the contamination level that um, pot potentially threatens our seafood supply, whether it's wild or, or farmed. And we are cautious about siting um, with regards to any kind of areas that would have contamination. Okay. Uh, the next, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of combine these two. Uh, these are both uh, questions related to red tide. Uh, Barbara asked, how would you prevent red tide and microplastics from entering farming areas on the west coast of Florida? And then uh, another attendee asked, said, uh, Southwest Florida is having serious issues with red tides as offshore cages will be affected by this. Two different questions there. So red tide and microplastics and then offshore cages and the potential effects there. Sure, absolutely. So at present, there's a lot of equipment and manufacturing companies that are partnering with academic institutions to look at recycled plastics, plastic integrity, um, to, to ensure that um, aquaculture operations are not contributing to the microplastic um, concerns that many of our coastal communities are facing. Um, uh, with regards to red tides, um, we do a lot of water quality modeling to look at the fate of materials, nitrogen, um, phosphorus emissions that are coming out of net pen operations. And it's given very, very careful consideration. Uh, with regards to um, aquaculture production, with regards to that. We also are very careful to not cite aquaculture in areas that um, have had a history of red tides or perennia brevis um, blooms or, or toxic occurrences happening. That's not good for aquaculture. And um, we wanna also make sure that aquaculture is not contributing to that. But we have some pretty complex water quality models that um, we've been able to model and show the fate of materials and the relationship between nutrients and phytoplankton and zooplankton and the ecosystem that um, that we use in, in, in forming siting decisions. Yeah. I do want to call everyone's attention to the, the chat. Uh, Ken and also Marcy, Marcy Cockrell have uh, put a link in to the report that uh, Ken referenced, uh, I believe, uh, just a few minutes ago, correct? Yeah. yeah. All right, yes. we have one. Yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. As, uh, that's correct. Okay. We do have one other question, um, and this says maybe this is in the toolkit. Um, I will tell you that this particular thing is not in the toolkit, but uh, I said I've recently heard about issues involving the net pens in Hawaii, mainly monk seal deaths and damage to coral reefs, which resulted in fines. What is the aquaculture industry doing about this? Sure, ab absolutely. So we've, we've, we're working with the farm and um, in Hawaii, our uh, NOAA Fisheries um, Office of Protected Resources, Protected Resources Division. Um, there was a monk seal death a few years ago. It's been quite some time um, where um, an unfortunate incident where a monk seal um, was trapped into, in a, got into a cage um, and um, became trapped and, and we, we lost the monk seal. And um, it is the one and only incident um, that has occurred on that farming site in, in over a decade. And, uh, and as a result of that, the farm working with community partners, nonprofit organizations and NOAA fisheries um, has underwater camera systems and detection systems now, and they've employed best management practices um, because they studied you know, the forensics of what had happened in that situation. And so they've been able to, 
um, develop methods to help prevent that um, situation from occurring uh, again. And then with regards to um, corals, um, there is a lot of work um, that is done with developing practices for deployment of cage systems um, and uh, prevention of the interaction, the siting, um, any kind of anchoring over corals and those kind of things. And, and we're not seeing any kind of impacts on the coral environment from that farm operation. Those, um, that particular farming operation, it was another farming operation that had those incidences that were referenced there in that chat. I do want to mention that with the, the actual toolkit, although a lot of the content is fairly generic as far as off, about aquaculture in, in general, uh, there are very uh, there are very there are several specific references to to Florida uh, as well. So um, that's when you when you mentioned that about Hawaii, it's like this toolkit probably would not have anything along those lines uh, related to that. Uh, comment here uh, says. Thank you for the program. Uh, so seafood harvesting and production remains one of the most dangerous occupations globally in promoting aquaculture production and business opportunities. There is a scarcity of safety and wellness information to support aquaculturalists, personal safety and injury prevention models, as well as promoting safety in this work environment to encourage incoming workforces. Uh, so he said, we'd like to uh, consider developing industry specific programs with you. So. That, that would be that'd be wonderful. And I would like to encourage folks to reach out to their um, their local um, state sea grant uh, specialist or sea grant aquaculture agent or cooperative extension agent. Um, those folks are really the boots on the ground, the eyes, the ears on the coastal community. They're working with much of our seafood industry that is unfortunately graying, and we're seeing a lot of you know aging uh, fishermen and ensuring that they have safe places to work. Um, and then also creating new safe places for new entrants in commercial fishing and aquaculture. And uh, that's a wonderful idea. And I think it's really, really important. Great. We may have time for, this probably will be the last question here. The question is, during the development of this toolkit, were opposition groups consulted? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, uh, op if you want to call opposition groups, they were definitely consulted. Um, um, part of the reason why we were trying to uh, to 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 work through this process of identifying any concerns that uh, uh, anyone had about aquaculture um, were were consulted and they were part of the uh, the uh, the focus groups um, as well. So yes, we we looked at all try to look at all aspects of this particular topic to address any and all concerns people had.